Hello, I'm Gary Quinn, and welcome to another episode of Ready, Set, Live. My guest today is Ross King, MBE, a four-time News Emmy and multi-award winning performer, and is one of Britain's most vibrant and versatile talents. In 2018, Ross was honored with an MBE from Her Majesty the Queen for his services to broadcasting, the arts, and charity. Ross is also a familiar face in the UK and in Europe, appearing daily on ITV's top-rated morning shows, Good Morning Britain and Lorraine, as their US correspondent. He has covered major events like the Oscars, Tonys, Emmys, Golden Globes, and Grammys, as well as significant major news stories. Don't go away. I'll be back with Ross King. Welcome, Ross. It's so <laughs> Thank great you. to have you. I feel after that introduction, we should say good night. That's all we've got time for, but thank you. <laughs> it was so great to finally see you and uh, to meet you again after all these years. Yeah, you too. Um, you know, your work is, is quite extraordinary. I think... Um, <laughs> your body of work speaks for itself. And I know growing up in Scotland, yeah. you had three major, let's say, epiphanies at age five, at age 15, wow. and age 17. Wow, there's a man who's done his homework. You, That's most you, impressive. You, I mean, you were five years old. What? How did you tell your mom I'm going to be an entertainer, or what did you say? <laughs> no, it's it's an interesting background because my mom and dad both were very musical. Uh, mom played the piano, so I would come home, you know, from school or even as a kid growing up, the piano was always being played. Dad was very musical. He was in the Salvation Army, and he conducted the band and the choir and played the euphonium and a whole host of instruments. So I was surrounded by music, and also I didn't really think so much at the time. I was surrounded by people really performing because you think of the you know the Salvation Army but then my dad would 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 host events and would crack jokes and then I had uncles who were also uh, early DJs and dance hall days oh. as well so Uncle Bill and Uncle Norman and Uncle Walter so I never thought we were in show business, <laughs> you know, but we kind of were. We were we were showbiz adjacent. How about that? Okay. So so I was surrounded by that. So it it was a sort of fairly natural step, I think. And, and basically, you know, I think being exposed at such a young age, all of a sudden you get the the wanting. I've got a. I mean, you didn't come over to the U.S. Then you were. You started working. You what? What age did you come to the U.S.? I. Oh my goodness me! Uh, I came here in two thousand, so twenty four years ago, which basically means I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> I think. I think. <laughs> but you were already working in London. Yeah, I was so. Doing I was so lucky, Gary, things. that I got into the, the the basic journey for me was again, as you were saying, when I was a kid at school and got into performing and acting and singing, and then when I was sixteen, uh, I joined the local radio station, which was a huge station called Radio Clyde that went all over the west and central Scotland, and I was so lucky that I came in. It was kind of like wham time, mm -hmm. and you know, all the other DJs were getting older and and heavier, and in came this you know kid that smiled a lot had kind of long blondish hair uh -huh. and it was like you know wake me up before you go go <laughs> and they were like put them on the road shows and things like that so I was so so lucky yeah I could hear your voice like you, uh, you'd be a great DJ <laughs> you have that, great, that great quality oh, thank you um so basically um you know what was the uh, was there an inspiration that drove you or what was your you know I think everybody has a certain epiphanies that happen that they say this is the role I want to do in life, or was there mm -hmm. was there some somebody you 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 looked up to as a as a mentor that you said I want to be just like him or yeah there were there were quite a few moments in my life Gary like that I think the first one was going back to when you say when I was five and I was doing a school play and it was Dick Whittington and I remember going on this stage and tripping and falling and as I fell I did like a little sort of you know forward row uh -huh. and got back up. And I got laughs and applause. And I think there was that pathetic thing as a child going, wow, there's applause, there's laughter. This could be for me. Um, but then as I got older, and I was, uh, I was playing football a lot, soccer, and that looked like what I was going to do. I was, I was going to be good enough to be an okay professional footballer, but not a very good one. Um, but my dad and mom were very encouraging. And when I said, look, I don't think I want to do the football side. I want to go into show business. They said, look, we just don't 
don't know Coco the Clown. We can't <laughs> help, but we'll support you, which is what they did. They said, whatever you want to do. And in the weird and wonderful way that you know that life works, uh -huh. when I was at school, my math teacher, a guy called Roddy Hood, had said to me, would you like to do some of the school discos? And I was like, okay, sounds fun to me. Then he said, Mrs. Lawson, another math teacher, her son, Alan, is a sound engineer at the BBC, but he got into it all through hospital radio. And so in Glasgow, they had the hospital radio station, which broadcast to all these um, hospitals. And you went in there and you learned, you learned a bit of your trade. So that's what I did. I went in when I was 15, still at school. And then again, local radio joined at 16 and did everything. I was the studio factotum. I just learned how to rig soccer grounds, put the cables okay. over. You know, as I look around your beautiful studio today, I go, oh, there's a male XLR. I could flip that. <laughs> so, you know, you, you never lose that side of things. And it was such a brilliant grounding. But also the, the advice that I got from my mum, and I remember thinking, I was much older when I realized what she meant. She would always say, and it's the thing I've heard it said in your show as well, just do your best. That's all you can do. And I think I was probably about 21 before I realized, yeah, if you do your best, that's all you can do. You know, whether it be auditioning for something or, or performing, if you've done your research, if you've done the work, even from a footballing point of view, was I training? Was I eating properly? Was I thinking, you know, ab about it all? So if you do your best, you cannot do any better. And if, it, if that doesn't match up to what someone wants, you can't do and, and you know what's so interesting? I think when anybody chooses a profession, especially the entertainment world, you know, people always say it's so hard or mm. this or that. But I think the intention of you being in the work, mm. it's 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 refreshing to see when a artist or performer is so into the work that their work jumps off the page. And I believe everybody has that magic, and we all have inspired to be this light or this essence of joy. And a lot of people don't seem to, you know, they get discouraged mm. quickly and you can't, you must never give up because that's the key for any, any work that one does. Um, what was your, let's say, being in the UK before you came to America, um, who was the person that you met <laughs> or your first interview there that you said, wow, that was, quite an, uh, an amazing or, in, or smashing oh, interview. Yeah, a smashing <laughs> interview. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, well, two, two things, I would say. The one, the interview that I remember going, oh, my goodness me, uh, was a man who used to say, my name is Bond, James Bond, Roger Moore. And so it was Roger, and he was incredible. And he was so lovely with me, and I was such a young guy at the time, and I was doing the interview for radio, and at the end of it, I always remember, I said, uh, I said, excuse me, Mr. Moore, uh, I said, would you do a jingle for me? And he went, a jingle? <laughs> and I said, you know, like, like an I didn't. He went, what would you like? And I said, well, <laughs> if you could say something like, you know, my name is Bond, James Bond, and he is King, Ross King. And he went, of course. I did, you could see people looking going, oh my goodness me, the kids asked this. And he did this whole lovely thing, which is, my name is King, no smoking, <laughs> no relation to Ross King, but I'm Bond, James Bond, and he is King, Ross King. And I just remember looking I at him and going, it. not only were you the most gracious, you've taken this time to, to look at this young guy and indulge him. But give me something which I played on the radio for years and years and years. And, you know, that that was it. And I think meeting someone of his magnitude who, apart from being, I always thought Roger was a great actor, but being a nice man, being self-deprecating, and he was James Bond. And he loved being James Bond. So I, I, I took a lot from that interview. Uh, and when I look back on it, and even now it gets me quite emotional when I think about that time, uh, it was such a, a wonderful moment. And I think a real eye-opener as to how someone like that can be so gracious, even at the very, very top. I love when the, 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 the most gra gracious um, interviews are, or the people who are so lovely and you just are so wowed by their kindness, you know. And then you see a few divas, and of course. you know. And but but it's interesting, you know. I, I think, uh, and and you probably know them. You, I have a longtime friend, um, David Courtney, mm -hmm. who used to be with Leo Sayer. Yes, so of you course. Probably yes, interviewed yes, Leo many yeah, times. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think that each person has a an essence, and I think a, a job of a 
of a host or interviewer is to find that best key. Who was your most difficult oh, wow. story or interview? Because, <laughs> you know, there uh, are those. There are those. Um, the interesting level, we were just talking about this the other day. The, the one that, that everyone thought was going to be difficult was Barbara Streisand. Because, again, so I, A Star is Born, I was at school when that came out. I went to see it. I loved Evergreen. I fell in love with her, Esther Hoffman Howard, and right. all the rest of it. And when I went to interview her, I was... I was concerned because I'd heard stories, you know, she can be a little difficult and all the rest of it. She was wonderful. She was gracious. She invited me back two weeks later to interview her again. When I went back to interview her again, they said the usual, you know, no pictures, no autographs, nothing like that. Fine. Um, we were doing the interview. It was overrunning, but she was chatting. Her publicist tried to step in and she was like, hey, come on. I'm, I'm chatting with Ross. I'm chatting with Ross. And I'd never, ever seen en that ever happen. Uh -huh. And then at the end of it, she said to me, um, because at one point I'd brought out a, a French 45 uh -huh. of her when she was 18, 19. And I sort of said, you know, what would Barbara now say to that girl? And she was like, well, I, I wouldn't say anything because it worked out all right. Um, and then at the end of it, she said, hey, Ross, should we do a photograph? And I was like, yeah. And I'm looking around because, again, you think, you know, it's Barbara and she's Correct. all the lighting. And I was like looking for a photographer and she went have you got a phone oh for goodness sake get your phone out and i was like okay and then and then she said do you want me to sign that for you and i was like yeah and so you know that was that moment but not evading the question of the most difficult i think the most difficult one but it did end up okay was uh russell crow and christian bale together and I got in, and I don't know whether they were having a bad day or they just decided, as we, as you know, Gary, with these junkets sometimes, people just get bored and they're fed up and it's the same questions and they're in a, a an earless hotel room. And I went in and I'd seen a couple of people come out looking not too happy and saying very, very, uh, very uh, not gracious things about what had been going on. And so I, my, I immediately sat down with them and, and I said, so you guys, were you up? against each other for similar roles or when did you first meet? And for some reason, he said, oh, uh, I think it was Russell. Went, yeah, mate, we were in the Boy Scouts together. And I was thinking, but Christian is originally from Wales. I was like, so where did you meet then? You know, was it like the, the World Jamboree or something? And then you could see them doing this. And then I said, well, of course, you both know the, the, the well-known Boy Scouts song, you know, Ging, Gang, Gully. Yeah. So they were kind of looking at me. And then they realized that I wasn't going to be phased. Yeah. And I was just going to keep going. <laughs> and if you want to do silly voices and blah, blah, blah. And then eventually at the end of the interview, I said, well, it's been an interesting one. I know you've had an interesting day. And Russell turned to, to Christian and said, there's only one way to finish this. And I went, with a song? They went, yeah, ging, gang, gilly, gilly, gilly. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone sang at the end. So that, that was a challenge, I would say. You know, um, do you have a ritual that you keeps you, uh, you know, your feet on the ground every day? You know, like some people meditate, mm. some people do yoga. Is there a schedule for Ross King that he I, follows? I do. I meditate. Okay. Um, I, I try to meditate like first thing in the morning. And sometimes, you know, that lovely way when you're when you're just coming out of your sleep. And sometimes if I set the alarm a little bit early, so I know that I can just lie there and just meditate. Uh, yoga. I love doing yoga as well because I think you get to a certain age, you need to stretch. Stretch. Uh, it's a big thing. I also, I, I give thanks to the universe every day. Uh, and I say it out loud, my gratitude to my mom and dad. And, and uh, you know, I'm not a hugely religious person, but I thank you to God and thank you to the universe. Um, so I do that and I say it out loud because I didn't realize before that with the gratitude, you, you need to say it. You need to say it out loud. So, yeah. And sometimes I'll just be sitting in the car, Gary. It's quite funny. And I'll just be going, thank you, mom and dad. Thank you, God. Thank you, universe. <laughs> um, so I do that. And, and then also, I think that just that thing of being mindful. And also, when I came to L.A., I went back to acting class for about three years. And one thing I learned there was to be present. And it, it was tricks that they gave me for going in for um, auditions. And I've never been a good auditioner at all, never been a good rehearser and all the rest of it. But what they taught me was to be present in the room. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I, I do now. So wherever, like even coming in to see you guys today, I'm very present so that 
I, it's a weird thing, and I've taught it to friends as well, just like simple tricks of how you do it and get yourself in the moment. Because I think life passes us by Absolutely. so fast. Absolutely. You know, and, and I, I just finished a new book called Sacred Happiness, and it's really about being in the moment yeah. that this is all the moment we have because tomorrow we don't know. And mm. I think so many people take life for granted and they have unhappiness because they're always searching outside themselves mm. instead of coming within and saying, you know what, I love I love Ross King this moment. My life is fantastic. Um, why would you what would you think the major situation, not only for celebrities or individuals who aren't happy why are they so unhappy these days it's a really good question i think because they're not appreciative of of everything that goes around and this may sound really really silly um but i will often if i'm sitting in the chair watching the tv and i think oh i'll go and have a cup of tea it goes through my head that i'm lucky that i can a get up and walk mm -hmm. and go to the kitchen and I've got water, and I've got electricity, and I've got a kettle, and I've got money to buy tea bags. And I know that may be sound, I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish anything, but I, I'm very mindful of things mm -hmm. like that and, and take it on board and think, again, how lucky I am. And, you know, you know we have instances, in, uh, even in the past couple of weeks, and um, I'm sure you, you knew Sam Rubin at KTLA. Yes. And, you know, Sam was, was, a, was a great pal. We worked together for six years. And you think, on the Thursday, he's in doing what we we're doing, being on screen, enjoying himself, Friday morning, not feeling great. By late Friday morning, he'd gone. Yeah. And you realize that thing of we are only here for the briefest of moments. So enjoy it. Enjoy every minute. And even the bad stuff, you go, there's probably a reason why this is happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think gratitude is the biggest thing. And we cannot take our, uh, you know, any, t any, any moment for granted. But, you know, that's why your day is full. And I know you're also an author. Mm. Tell me about the books. Oh, yeah. Because that's brilliant. <laughs> well, I write with a, a really lovely lady called Shari Lowe, and she's just sold gajillions of books. She's really, and at the moment, she's absolutely on fire with, with her writing. Um, she came to me a few years ago and said, uh, one of the publishers has come and said, would uh, I ghostwrite your biography? And I said, well, it's a leaflet, it's a pamphlet. <laughs> we can just hand that out to the family at Christmas. I said, I have no desire. I love biographies. House is full of them. I have no desire whatsoever to, to spill my, not that they're secrets, but, and I don't, I have also had a very, I had a very lucky life. Came from a lovely working class background in Glasgow and here I am in Hollywood. But I said, I have no, no desire at all. I said, but... I said, I write with some people in terms of scripts and what have you. I said, but I've never written a book, but I do have some ideas. And she said, okay, well, I haven't written with anyone. We need to sit down and think of different stories. And I said, well, we could put some of the stories from my life in it, mm -hmm. amp them up, bring mm -hmm. them down, whatever. And the long and short was that I said, well, I've got this idea about these three young Scots, blah, and about an hour later, it was like, uh, I think we've got the basis for the book. And then we just continued to write. And we've written three already. And there's two more to come. So it. <laughs> it's I amazing. It. It's amazing. <laughs> so tell me, I know a lot of people in, the, um, in America don't know what an MBE is. Yes. That is actually when Her Majesty the Queen gives you. It, it's not a knighthood, but it's no. almost like a. Uh, it's the beginning. <laughs> light, it's like a knighthood light. Okay. <laughs> So how does that work? Is, are you? Are, do they vote for you, or someone says from Buckingham Palace, Ross King? Is yeah, I, th I, I don't. It's kind of secretive in some uh -huh. respects, so, because you don't know mm. that either somebody's put you for maybe one of the charities that I'd worked for, or somebody else has put put your name forward, and then it goes forward, and then it's it's looked upon by this group of different people and then they look and, and I mean I was so surprised I mean so thrilled to get it for broadcasting mm -hmm. the arts because I've thankfully I've done quite a lot of theater work as well and for charity as well and th the interesting thing for me Gary was that 
when I was a kid, it was a big, big thing in Britain that uh, New Year time and the Queen's birthday, it was the Queen's birthday's honours list, the New Year's honours list. And because my mum and dad did so much for charity over the years, whenever it would come out, I'd go, Dad, Dad, you, why, why are you not getting something? Uh -huh. And he said to me, he said, son, people like us don't get things like that. And that always stuck in my head. So it was never, ever a tiny thought that I would, be gonged by the queen and uh, so when it happened i just thought it's for my mom and dad you it's see, for them that's that's brilliant um when you do the um because you were just in london when i met you yeah. um how often do they uh, bring you over for good morning britain or, or lorraine um well i go i travel over maybe four times a year okay, at least so, four and then you go and do the because i saw you on tv that morning <laughs> that's right it was on lorraine <laughs> I see you in the airport after, but, uh, but um, you know, what does that feel like when you go back there? Is it a, a bit, because, you know, sometimes it's like going home. It is. It is very much like going home. And but then home is here also. Absolutely. And I think that's a great thing. You know, you know what it's like, Gary, you, you know, you adapt because of our business and what you do, what I do. We just adapt. So, you know, you can make any place home. home. And, but there will always be, for me, Scotland Glasgow will always be home home and you know I was lucky that when we met at the airport um, I'd had the most bizarre incident where I'd been in Glasgow to interview Take That Take That huge pop group in Britain and Europe play stadiums and they were playing three nights in Glasgow at the Glasgow Hydro which holds something like 15 20,000 people Gary Barlow who's the lead yes. singer so he's one of my best friends so I'm sitting in a hotel across from the hydro with my my friends. Um, there's about 10 of us and we're waiting to go to the concert. And it's about quarter to seven. The show's meant to start at 7.30. There's a support act, Ollie Murs, who's a big star in Britain, had many number ones. Bottom line Ollie is- Ollie was on the, on the Simon Cowell, right? That's right, uh, yes, yeah. well done. He yes, was done. On, uh, he was the indeed. the show the other night. That's right. Him. So Ollie couldn't make it. Gary called me and said, um, you're going to, you have to go on. I was like, what? He went, you've got to go on. We don't have a support act. You need to go on. So I then said, okay, it's now like 10 to 7, 5 to 7. I need to go on at 7.30. I said, look, there's also a young guy playing here in the, the, the restaurant. He's a nice player, nice singer. Why don't I bring him over? So Gary said, well, if you can go on first, because obviously you've got to tell the crowd, Ollie Murs is not going to be appearing. And then you can do a little bit, bring him on, then come back on, do a couple of songs with him at the end. So I did it, but it was that great thing. It was my hometown. It was Glasgow. So people go, how on earth can you go from having a meal in a restaurant, and then getting a call, and then being in front of 15,000, 20,000 people in half an hour? But it's your hometown. So to walk out again in my hometown and then to say to my home crowd, guys, I'm going to bring it another young boy from Glasgow. I know you're disappointed Ollie's not making it, but here's this young guy. And it's changed his life. And it was, it, you know, how how lucky are we to be in a situation where you can turn around to someone and genuinely say, I'm going to ask you something or tell you something that will change your life. And it is. And he's got a new single out now. And wow. a, lovely, a lovely guy, Daniel Rooney, and such a lovely, lovely young guy. So, um, again, we're so lucky that that whole thing of giving back and giving back and not expecting anything in return, I think, is the big thing. And I think that's the, the thing is you're giving from the heart. And when you give back, the universe gives back to you. Exactly. And, that, you know, so many people, oh, I can't give away my contacts or I can't give. <laughs> you know, there's enough for everyone. I agree. And I think these people that think that way, they're limited thinking, you know. Absolutely. Um, if you could go back in time <laughs> to speak to someone and they're they're not here, no longer living, what would you, who would it be and what would you ask them? Ah, great question. What a they great can, question. They can be performers, they can be scholars, they can be authors, they can be wow. Julius Caesar. Wow. <laughs> it, doesn't <matter. laughs> it doesn't matter at all. <laughs> it's, uh, that's such a great question. I've never, ever had that question before. Never, ever actually really thought about it until now. Um, you know, I, I think it would be interesting. That there was a, a, a Scots uh, performer called Harry Lauder who wrote amazing songs, Keep Right On to the End of the Road, sang you know, many famous songs, I Belong to Glasgow, and and back in his day, he was earning something like, oh, 25,000 pounds then a week 
I mean, you can can you only begin to imagine what it must have been like? Uh, and this is back in like the twenties and thirties. And so to to achieve the level that he did then, I think it would be fascinating to to sit and have a uh, a chat with him. Um, and again, just some of the I I also feel so lucky that I that I got to interview a lot of people that as a, when I was a kid, Charlie I met Charlie Chaplin when I was five. Wow. I mean that's ridiculous. I'd like to have sat with Charlie Chaplin actually because he was this old man in a, a big black coat and the Homburg hat, and I'd like to have met the young Charlie into you know when you see how much he did for for artists as well. Um, I think it would be th those people as well that I'd like to to talk to about their career because what they went through as as a child and coming through and what they had to put up with, especially back in the day. Um, so, yeah, I, I, again, I think it's because I love biography, so I probably should have chosen someone much more sort of, you know, history-making you know so worthy. <laughs> and, you know, when I first came to Hollywood, I was young, and I was thrown into the entertainment world, and I had the opportunity to meet Charles Bronson and Jill oh, Ireland. Oh. And at that point, I didn't really know who they were. <laughs> I was like 21, but they were so kind to me. Yeah. And I, they, they signed everything. We didn't have cell phones back then, but you know, I remember sitting with them in the makeup room and chatting with them for a good two hours. And it was just, you know, those moments oh. you cannot forget absolutely and then i had another dinner with james coburn oh wow and that <laughs> it was very interesting because he knew he was ill and, mm. he, I, and i knew intuitively that he was going to pass oh. and he was asking me all these questions because i'm very intuitive and my some of my books in the beginning had had information so i sat there and i knew he was curious what the other side is about, mm. but I'll never forget that dinner. And you know, it, I think I think that's the the magic of Hollywood mm. that those times those people are are gone. Yeah, and and there'll be there there will be no one like them. You know, again, right. I think like you know, I think of uh, Donald O'Connor came on a chat show I had at the BBC, and we we tap danced. To, I, I mean, I it. don't really tap dance, but I mean, you know, he gave me a tap lesson, and then back in the day, I came out and interviewed Esther Williams, and I, I hung out with Esther. Yeah. She she gave me a quote from my second book. There we are. And what was so brilliant with Esther is she would sit with me and said. Gary, do you remember when we went to Perino's? And, we went, and I go, yeah, tell me about it. I yeah, forgot. Yeah. But I would spend hours with her listening to this. Uh, it was just brilliant. Yeah. And she she obviously was losing, you know, because yeah. I was an ex-swimmer for swimming. Oh, uh, wow. Competitive. Were... So we had that in common. <laughs> but she would sit hours um, telling me these stories, how she uh, she said, oh, I, I was a sales girl at the, at the whatever the store it was, Neiman Marcus yeah. or whatever the store was. And she said, I didn't want to audition. And this agent used to come in and want for me to go see Mr. DeMille. And I was like, no, no, no. Or, or, or Mayor uh, Golden. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And so, so it was real interesting to just, you know, I, I, you, we cherish those moments. Oh. I mean, I think for you, there's a book there. Yeah. There, on, the, on old I, Hollywood. I think there is a book of, yeah, the, the, the time spent with. Um, yes. And again, and also it's, it's interesting when you're saying people being so gracious. You know, I was so lucky to play Frankenfurter in the Rocky Horror Show. And then I did a play read out here for Eric Idle from Monty Python. And Tim Curry was there, who, of course, was okay. Frankenfurter in the movies. And at the end of the, the play read, you know, we're now kind of a little bit chummy. And I was like, uh, Tim, do you mind if 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 you sign? And he was like. Darling, of course, and you know, and I, but I brought out like every, you know, there was the poster, there was the the album, there oh, were, you know, <laughs> and you know, and the graciousness of of him saying, you know, like don't dream it, be it, or to Ross, fellow Frank, but who did it better and think, you know, just I think it's it's when people just take that little bit of time, you know, and I. I'm, I'm not going to mention who it is. It was a big superstar and a friend of mine who's who's older guy, so he's not like a kid. Went up to this um, major superstar and said, "Oh, would you mind if I have a photograph?" And they said yes. And he was about to relay a very important story, very brief. And the star said, "No stories, just the photograph. No stories, just the photograph." And I thought, I understand you're that big a superstar, and you must get pestered all the time. But I thought the story he was going to relate to you was very important and actually would have been very beneficial to him as well. But it was like, no, that negating. And I always think, again, 
we just want to be positive. You know, Correct. get up, enjoy the day. You know, the DM is there to be carpeted, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. Mm -hmm. When you leave this experience in this lifetime, mm -hmm. how do you want to be remembered? Ooh. Um, Ross King, B.E. <laughs> -E was? was? He was a good guy. Okay. He was a good guy. Yeah, that that if I if I get left with that, he was he was one of the good ones, then I'll be happy. <laughs> good. I am so thrilled for you to be here today. Thank you so much, Ross, for having this time with me. Thank you. And I appreciate I wish you it. All the great success with all the things you're doing and the new things you'll be doing. Well, let's hope so. And uh thank you and uh thank you all for joining me in this special episode of Ready Set Live. Until next time. Be well.